Well, hello everybody here. Very welcome again to clicking into our little uh, Sunday mini service. And again, for the next while, just with the continued restrictions, we, we meet like this uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we anticipate government making announcements uh, soon uh, that will give us at least a direction uh, to be able to meeting together again in our buildings. And so for uh, our friends in Fawn Church and for Ryan Newton and for other folk who click in each week, uh, again, you're very, very welcome this morning. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who contributed to our Easter service just two Sundays ago. Thank you so much for all who took part with the music and with the readings and with the prayers. It was just very, very much appreciated. And also just to let you know, uh, starting this Wednesday again, our little Wednesday in the Word uh, series. We're going to actually jump into it. So it's a favourite passage of scripture of mine in Luke chapter 24, uh, just the road to a mess story. But to actually just take maybe four or five weeks, maybe even longer, maybe six weeks, uh, to look at, at that story of the disciples on the road to a mess and Jesus coming and walking with them. And, and so really on Sunday and on, on Wednesday, we're going to look through Luke and actually spend the next little while in Luke chapter 15 and uh, the parables of the lost and then in Luke 24 on Wednesdays looking at the Emmaus road and so we come to worship this morning and Luke chapter 19 verse 10 Jesus says I have come to seek and to save those who are lost I have come to seek and to save those who are lost and say so we're going to look then in Luke 15, saying Luke all the time, um, but in Luke 15 at the lost parables over the next period of time. And we're just going to worship together now as we sing, Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's worship God together as we sing, Amazing grace, my chains are gone.
let's pray together please let's let's pray lord god we come to you this day still with the truth of easter ringing in our ears we're on the cross you gave your life to save the lost and lord we are a thankful people as we gather and as we listen in our homes and houses remind us this day lord of your great grace your tender mercy for when we are found by you and in you we who once were lost are found those who were once blind now can see father in heaven we do not deserve your wonderful mercy for we know our wayward hearts we know our disobedient spirits and we are very aware that anything we do to try to attain or to buy your favour or your forgiveness will just fall short. Scripture reminds us, Lord, that all our righteous acts are just like filthy rags. So we come before you, Lord, only by grace, only through your amazing grace. For it is in Christ alone that our hope is found. And once again, Lord, as we gather, we, we ask for your forgiveness. Coming to you and confessing our sin. And we ask, Lord, like David, like King David in Psalm 51, that you would create in us clean hearts, renew your right spirit within us, and restore to us the joy of our salvation. Grant us a willing spirit, Lord, to sustain us as we seek to follow you. So lead us now, Lord, as we wait on you. May we hear your voice and sense your spirit as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask all this in the gracious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Karen and I are just going to read together now uh, the whole of the chapter of Luke chapter 15 from verse 1 through to verse 32 and just take uh, part about but just to get a whole flavour of this whole passage that we're going to look at over the next few weeks. So we read together in Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wide living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. 
He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. And now just before Gordy comes to speak to us today, we're going to sing that lovely chorus, Focus My Eyes on You, O Lord. Focus my eyes on you Focus our eyes on him 
uh, turn our hearts back to him just as we, we turn to his word just now. And, and we're returning to one of the most familiar passages of scripture. Um, William Barclay says actually that there is no chapter in the New Testament so well known and so dearly loved. Um, now he's thinking specifically there I think of the, the prodigal son story in Luke 15 but but there are three stories, uh, three stories of lostness with one main message within it. And uh, it, it reminds me of, oh goodness, I think it was 2001 or 2002, um, Karen and I and the family had moved up to Cool Rain and uh, maybe probably to give Karen a, a wee bit of a rest. I took Robin with me, went down to Tesco to get some groceries and uh, she was a toddler. And we went into the shop and at one stage I just looked round and she had vanished. I couldn't see her anywhere. My heart was pounding out of my chest and well you can imagine the picture. Uh, I ran around Tesco twice, couldn't see her anywhere. Uh, and I, I spoke to security guard and messaged in the tannoy. I was out into the car park and I was just beginning really to go frantic. And standing close to where uh, we had been together at one stage, maybe only five minutes uh, earlier. But to say, I was just frantic. And then I noticed in the photo booth, just these wee feet dangling from underneath the curtain in the photo booth. And there was Robin, had clambered her way into it and up onto the seat and swinging about on the seat in the photo booth. But here, the father's heart was just, as I say, pounding out of his chest and so concerned and so worried about my wee daughter. Um, and it gives me maybe just a, a little flavour of the, the father in the third story here in Luke chapter 15. But what we want to do today is just take an overview of the whole chapter because when you put the chapter into its context, it, it allows it and helps and uh, makes so much more sense. I want to think just about three things, a congregation, the complaint, and then the content. And when we look at the congregation here, it reminds me of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, two tribes go to war. Because as the story starts, as this parable uh, starts, it starts within this context. The tax collectors and the sinners had gathered to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were there listening in. As I say, the two tribes go to war. Here within the congregation were the tax collectors and the sinners. Those that the religious establishment looked upon with almost disgust and disdain. And then also there lurking in the shadows and in around were the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. Those who were wanting to, to nitpick. And actually in the bigger context of the whole passage, some of the scholars say that the tax collectors and the sinners here uh, are representing the younger brother in the prodigal son story. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law are representing the older brother. So hold that in your head for a few weeks as we get to unpack this and look a bit further. Timothy Keller, a um, chap from the States, great scholar, says Jesus is speaking to both curious outsiders and established insiders of the faith. Who are the congregation? They are the curious outsiders and the established insiders of the faith. And they're all there listening to Jesus. Some to pick holes, but actually what's really interesting, if you look at verse 1, the tax collectors and sinners, and you would miss this, all gathering round, to hear him. They were there with hungry hearts. They were there because there was something in Jesus that attracted them. What was it in Christ's message that did attract them? Again, Tim Keller says here within the story and what Jesus is wanting to do, Jesus' purpose is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our cat categories. Jesus here is not there to warm our hearts with a nice wee soppy sentimental story. 
but he's there. There's a bigger purpose here in the congregation to shatter the categories of the two tribes going to war. The tax collectors and the sinners, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And maybe especially when I say the tribes go to war, it's the religious people that are so incensed by Jesus. Listen to their complaint. Verse 2, second part. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Not only does Jesus spend time with those who are despised by the religious establishment, but to eat with them in that Eastern culture, in that Mediterranean culture, was just an absolute affront. And it meant that you accepted their behaviour. Well, that's the way it was taken. Certainly not in how Jesus lived. But when you had table fellowship, as it's called, it was like taking it to another level and spending time with these people. And so the congregation is just two different groups of people. And the complaint is that this man welcomes sinners and he even eats with them. Tim Keller, again, quoting him a lot here, but religious, religiously observant people were offended by Jesus, but those estranged from religious and moral observance were intrigued and attracted to him. Let me read that again, and especially the second, but religiously observant people were offended by Jesus here in the congregation. But those estranged from religious and moral observance were intrigued and attracted to him. Now what's the upshot of that? It reminds me again, and I know I quote it often, that passage in 2 Corinthians 2 and 16, to the one living for Jesus, to one we are the smell of death, and to the other the fragrance, fragrance of life. We are the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. To some we are the smell of death, to others the fragrance of life. And that's exactly what's going on in the congregation here. And that's what's seen in the complaint that comes from the people. That there are those who are being repelled and there are those who are being attracted. There are those who are being incensed and there are those almost who are being inspired. And there's something, especially within those who are outside of the religious loop, that there's something that they can't put their finger on it. And I think, folks, for you and I today, as we seek to live for Jesus in today's world, in a world that's increasingly turning its back on the ways of faith and the truths of faith, there are also those who are attracted and those who are curious. And again, in the complaint, what's going on here is that Jesus is living totally counterculturally. And it's causing confusion and it's causing mystery. Also for the religious leaders, because there's so many following Jesus, there is jealousy that's in there as well. And that's what's going on. That's the context of this passage and these parables that are being shared. Well, let, let's quickly look at the content. What is the content? There's three stories that are linked thematically. I found it really interesting that there's no brethren scholar called Graham Scroggie, and he said this, thinking of the three stories, the three parables, the shepherd in the lost sheep, the shepherd represents Christ. The woman in the lost coin represents the spirit indwelt Christian or the church. And then the father in the lost son's story represents God the father. So there's an interesting thing there about, well, this is an old brethren scholar saying that there's three pictures here. The shepherd represents Christ. The woman represents the spirit indwelt Christian or the church. And the father represents God the father. Don't know if I'm completely given with that. Um, but it's interesting that there are pictures and there are themes that are going on here that we need to catch hold of. Losing, searching and celebrating. There are three themes that are very clear in this passage. Losing, searching and celebrating. There's the lost sheep in verse 4 through to verse 7 of chapter 15. There's the lost coin in verses 8 through to 10. 
and they're the lost sons in verse 11 through to 32. And whenever again you dig down into that as well, how do we understand these things that are lost from the actual human beings and the two sons to the coin and to the sheep? Maybe it could be argued that the sheep are lost through their own foolishness and their own waywardness. Sheep without a shepherd and again goodness there are lots of biblical themes there and we'll look at that next week. The lost coin for the lady, possibly a wedding band, lost maybe out of carelessness, we don't know. So possibly foolishness, carelessness, for one of the sons most definitely through rebelliousness. But there's this other son at home and he is as much lost as the rebellious son who went away. There's one whose rebelliousness is open and there's another whose rebelliousness is hidden. And actually again as we dig down into that, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart for these two boys. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Losing, searching, celebrating. Let's think about searching just for a moment. See, we read here in the stories about, we'll read about the shepherd. Does he not leave the 99 and go after the one? Or the lady, does she not light a lamp, sweep and search the house? Searching. For the story of the, the, the prodigal son, we read in verse 20 of chapter 15, But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. And was filled with compassion for him. And there's, there's a picture there. And maybe it's a wee bit sentimentalised. About the father on the roof of the house. And every day he went up and he was longing and looking. Uh, for this rebellious son to come back home. But we do, I mean there it is in verse 20. While he was still a long way off the father saw him. The father maybe recognised something about the gate of his walk. There was something that he just recognised. Maybe the physical shape of the boy and we read that he runs down the road to greet him but in the story there's the losing of the sheep of the coins of the sons and then there's the searching that for the shepherd and for the woman they physically went after these items that were lost and here for the father there was a longing in his heart for this boy to return but also in each story the third theme that's very clear is celebrating. Rejoice with me, says the shepherd, for the sheep that was lost is found. Rejoice with me, says the lady, because I have found the coin that was lost and she invites neighbours and friends and they have a feast and they celebrate. And then for the father in the story in verse 23, let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of man who was lost and is found. So there's rejoicing that goes on, there's party, there's celebrating. Um, and, and again, just you know, just to stop briefly, um, it's one thing in church that we're a wee bit stiff and sore, aren't we? And here, I was at, uh, Tony Campolo has written a book called The Kingdom of God is a Party. And it talks here in the, the, the passage about rejoicing in heaven and rejoicing with the angels. And when we read about Jesus, we sp read about him spending time uh, you know, at a wedding banquet. And, you know, there's something in what we read of Jesus. that He was a man who was, he enjoyed fun. It seems to be inherent there in scripture. But losing, searching and celebrating are th key themes within the passage here. There's also that idea of rejoicing. There's a picture of question about righteousness and repentance that's going on, the bigger themes of those who are listening in the congregation and about their own self-righteousness rather than righteousness in Christ. And there's a picture of repentance in the son who actually came back to the father uh, craving a uh, relationship with him again or even to become a hired hand. Rejoicing, righteousness and repentance inherent in the passage, losing, searching, celebrating. How do we pull this together? This is just an overview for today. Again, let's go back to 20 years ago when me losing Robin in Tesco. And the father's heart was just so deeply concerned. 
that again at the heart of Luke 15 is God's heart for the lost. God's heart for the lost. And as he's standing with this group of people, the tax collectors and sinners and the religious hierarchy, his heart is for the lost. And actually his heart's for both of them. And again, let's, let's jump right away back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. Because we read in the Garden of Eden, God's heart for the lost. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? At the beginning of sin coming into the world, an estrangement between God and man, God the Father is coming looking for his people and desiring that relationship that's broken to be restored. Adam, where are you? I love the passage in, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, thinking about Egypt. And again, the people of God are lost in bondage in Egypt. And as God meets with Moses at the burning bush, he says, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about them and their suffering. And I have come down to rescue the God who comes to rescue the lost, to save the lost. In 1893, uh, there was a man, Francis Thompson, who wrote a poem called The Hound of Heaven. Uh, and it became a very famous, mystical, but Christian poem, uh, likening God to the Hound of Heaven, who searches for and goes after those who are lost. And actually, I read that the Hound of Heaven is the first chapter in John Stott's book, Why I Am a Christian, in which he confesses that he is a Christian, not because of the influence of his parents and teachers, nor to his own personal decision, but to being relentlessly pursued by the Hound of Heaven. And that is Jesus Christ himself. So in John Stott's book, Why Am I a Christian? He said it's because God sought me. God came after me to rescue me when I was lost. Think about Eden. Think about Egypt. Think about Christ himself. We read it at the very beginning of our time together today. In Luke 19 and 10, Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. And so for you this morning or today at whatever time you're listening uh, to this, do you feel that you're lost uh, outside of Christ, lost uh, in your sin and rebelliousness? As is it, That's everybody's struggle. Everyone has sinned, fallen short of God's glory. But God, his heart is for the lost and wants us to be found. And like the hound of heaven... He, he will relentlessly pursue us to win us for himself. Question for you. What is your heart before him this morning? What did we think a little while ago? The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And you can be lost in your religious observance, but not a relationship. And you can be lost in your rebelliousness and need found and come into relationship with Jesus. The other point within the big story here, again, Graham Scroggy, that brethren preacher, says publicans and Pharisees, sinners and scribes were all equally lost. But some were conscious of the fact and admitted it, and others were not and did not. And so what camp do you fall into this morning or today as you listen to this? Again, Romans 3 and verse 10 tells us that there's no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23, the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm going to sing just now a great modern hymn, When I Was Lost, You Came and Rescued Me. In this song, I think... Thinking about celebration earlier, it just is packed with joy in being found by Christ and in Christ. And so hold on to those thoughts and over the next few weeks 
we're going to work our way through uh, the whole of this chapter and its different segments. But we think about the congregation who were there. We think about the complaint of the religious leaders. We think about the content of the passage, about being lost, but the one who searches for us and the celebration when we're found to be in Christ. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We thank you that these words are as true today as they were thousands of years ago when they were first written, because you, Lord God, are the same yesterday, today and forever. Lord, as we look back, we see how you have been at work in our lives over the years, how you have led and guided, how you have provided all that we have needed, and we see that you have worked in many different ways, through many different means. You have used both the good times and the bad times to make us the people we are today. You have been using our experiences to grow our faith and trust in you. Lord, this past year has been difficult and challenging for each one of us in different ways. We pray for those who have been bereaved. 
asking that they would know your comfort and your peace as they face a new and different future. May they remember that you are walking the road with them. For those who have found it to be especially lonely and isolating because of lockdown restrictions, we pray that they may have found you to be the friend who sticks closer than a brother, and may their relationship with you have deepened and matured. Many people are facing ill health and are struggling with the reality that their prayers for healing have not been answered. We ask, Lord, that you would calm their fears, reassure them of your love, remind them of your promises, and give them the grace they need to trust you for the future. We thank you, Lord, for the continuing rollout of the vaccination programme, and we pray that you would give us patience as we wait for restrictions to ease, and wisdom as we begin to enjoy our newfound freedoms. Thank you for reminding us today that we all are or have been lost because of our sinfulness. Thank you that you are a God of love, mercy and grace, who has come to rescue and save the lost and bring them into your family. Thank you for your amazing grace. And we pray for those we love, who are still in rebellion against you, that they would acknowledge their need of you and surrender their lives to you. Although we are still unable to meet together in person, thank you that we can worship you together online. We can bring our songs and our prayers, and we can hear your word read and explained. Thank you that your word is living and active, and is useful for teaching, correcting, guiding and encouraging us, as your spirit speaks its truth into our lives. We ask that you would speak to us today, so that we may come to know you better. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you, Karen, for leading us in prayer. And we'll just uh, close our time together with the benediction. We ask now, may the grace of Christ attend us. May the love of God surround us. And may the presence of the Holy Spirit keep us, both now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today and just pray God's blessing on you and your homes, your families and your friends. Take care.